But it is a joy to have Brother Leonard with us this week. And uh, Brother Johnny said, we were standing at the back door tonight, and he said, I love that fire of West Virginia preaching. And uh, I do too. And I appreciate that so much. I appreciate his passion. appreciate the, uh, the truth that he preaches. And um, as I mentioned this morning, been very, very faithful over the years and through very fluid circumstances in the area that he is in, uh, changing circumstances beyond his control. Uh, but God has kept him there, and God has used him to reach a, a good, good number of people in that area. And um, God is using him already here in our presence. And so, so thankful to have Brother Leonard back with us tonight. And uh, so, come on up, brother, and preach what uh, the Lord has laid upon your heart. A good church. You've got a beautiful facility, but the facility is not your church. Your church is sitting right there. And thank God that you're behind your pastor the way you are. Um, I said I was going to say a little more about Alan. Uh, he, of course, can give me whatever gratuity he wishes as I speak about him. <laughs> and uh, it depends on how good it is, I reckon. But uh, I, I admire him a lot. I really do. Um, I have studied at both places where he has. He's put a lot of time in to get his advanced education and his education and his studies. Um, he is truly uh, just a man that loves the Word of God. And Alan has been like that since I've known him. I've known him all the way back from the days at Union Chapel when he was a youth pastor. And uh, how he worked so hard with the young people. But... He did not work alone. He had a tremendous lady that's been with him all these years that stood by his side and done a great deal. Uh, I say that because you folks are blessed. I, I, you're really blessed, and I hope, and I believe you realize that. You're also blessed with the talents you have here. Man alive. I may have to preach on covetousness just to keep myself in line. But uh, your talent, uh, the talent is singing and and the other abilities you have is, is just amazing. But I want you to take your Bibles tonight with me, please, and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. And, and I realize I haven't turned this on, guys. I'm going to do that right now. Okay. And so uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. I, I really wanted to, again tonight, to go another direction. But the Lord wouldn't give me peace uh, on the message that I really thought that I was going to be allowed to preached tonight. But 1 Peter chapter 1, I would like for us to focus tonight on this thought, why do Christians react differently? Why do Christians react differently? And this is the reason I want us to think about this, is because we're in a day and age to where people need to see true and real Christian character. They don't need to see something that is artificial, something that's fake. They need to see something that's real. I had a young man just a few days ago, and uh, I had another illustration to open with, but I'm going to use this because I think it fits so well. A young man told me a story about something that happened on a shift that he was working at his job. He said at that job that night, he went in on that shift, and the manager that he was working under that night is a little older, and I've got to admit, when you get older, you get a little more grumpy. I, I mean, honestly, I don't mean that as a cut down by any of you, but I'm telling you, as you get older, let's be honest, you just can't put up with much junk, can you? You just don't have the patience for it. Uh, I mean, I love my kids to death, but the noise past 10 o'clock at night, I start getting grumpy. It just, you know, I, I just can't handle certain things. So it's, it's when you're older, it's tougher. And this manager is a little older. And this young man dealing with this manager that night, this manager got a little upset about some things that probably shouldn't got upset about. So he decided to do a little cursing, a little cussing. And what's amazing about this particular person, there's a little bit of profession there that they're a Christian. Now, 
I don't know about you, but there are people out there that, are, that profess to be Christians that cuss like somebody just got off a, a Navy boat, okay? And not everybody in the Navy ought to cuss, amen? You don't have to cuss just because you're a sailor. You know, you've heard that all your life, right? Cuss like a sailor. You don't have to cuss just because you're a sailor. You, you can speak pure truth, amen? But the thing is, is that this young man dealing with this situation dealt with it all night long. And, and as I was talking to this one young man, I realized that he had dealt with this often during different times, and I didn't know it. And really, I feel bad because I didn't even know the character of my own son. I really didn't. And he said after he got done with his shift, he, uh, he looked at the boss that was dealing with him that night and, and said to him, he said, listen, he said, I know you've had a tough night. I know you've been having a tough day. He said, I'm going to be praying for you that things will start out being better for you. And uh, I promise I'll pray for you. And he said he walked out the door. He said a couple days later he went back to work and that boss called him in the office and apologized for how he acted the other night. Now, none of us are perfect. I'm not putting any one individual on a pedestal of perfection. But when Christ is in your heart, there ought to be some evidential differences. It should change some things. And when you look here in 1 Peter, why do Christians react differently? We see the reasoning in verses 1 through 5. The Bible says in verse 1 of 1 Peter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God, revealed, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. Why do Christians react differently? Father, I pray tonight that you will strengthen me and guide me and help me. Lord, I am incapable of being a blessing of any sort in myself or in my flesh. God, tonight, I beg of you, Father, may your sweet spirit work within our lives and in our hearts. God, it is to your glory that anything is done. I cannot take any credit. I cannot take anything because it all is yours. God, tonight speak to us. We've gathered here for a purpose. May you speak to our hearts and draw us closer to you to be better for you. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We look at this passage of Scripture, and there are five things, and don't get nervous, we'll try to go through them pretty quick. Five things that I believe this text shows us why the believer, the Christian, reacts differently. The first thing I want you to notice is found in verse number 2. The Bible says there again, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Now, we are free will Baptists, at least this is a free will Baptist church. But we still believe that we are chosen. We still believe that. Peter here talking to the Christians in Asia Minor, basically this is present day Turkey. Dr. Piccolelli makes this statement. This election that we look at in verse number 2, as often in the New Testament, is apparently the act of God in eternity making a loving choice of individual believers on his own. Let me read that again. Dr. Pickle really states, this election, as often in the New Testament is, apparently the act of God in eternity making a loving choice of individual believers to be his own. That is, he goes on to say, Arminians and Calvinists both affirm such eternal elections. Calvinists need change the definition I have just given only by admitting the word believers 
Thus making the choice or election of individuals unconditional. However, salvation is conditional and it is conditioned on faith. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, if you look over there in that passage, you can if you'd wish, and beginning in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 2 it says, But God who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherein He what? Loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, what did He do? He quickened us. That is, He uh, enlivened us or revived us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. And we know these next two verses well. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For what? We, verse 10 a lot of times gets left off. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, with God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Arminians and free will Baptists are not afraid of the foreordination of God. It is a biblical doctrine. The difference is, is that we say believers are foreordained. Why? Because they're foreordained based on the foreknowledge of God knowing who will be saved and who will not. That is, God does not make you get saved. It is your choice. You choose the path of salvation. Dr. Pickle really goes on to make the statement, Peter's words provide the basis for the Arminian insistence that God's election is in accord with His foreknowledge, not vice versa. The foreknowledge of individual believers stands logically first and provides a platform for the election. Thus, the words are best understood in the terms of conditional election. The foreknowledge is certainly a foreknowledge of them as believers. So when we think about that topic tonight, and still in the framework of why do Christians respond differently, when I say tonight it's because we are the chosen of God, we realize it, it's because we have made through the movement and working of the Holy Spirit in our life that choice to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and as our Savior. And because we have done so, we are different and we are unique individuals made in the likeness of Christ through His power and through His work. He's living through us and because He has chosen us, we react differently to the rest of the world. And I'm here to tell you tonight, Christians should not be reacting, living out, or acting like people that are lost in this world. You ought to be able to tell the difference. When you go into a Dollar General, and they're everywhere. My little one of my adopted ones is here tonight. She works at Dollar General. I'll pick on you, Carter. I, I know when my wife and I were driving back, I don't know, we drive back from anywhere. Tennessee, I don't care if you go to Virginia, I don't care where you go, you get on a back road, it's lucky you don't pass a Dollar General every 150 miles or less. They're everywhere. But you know what? When you work in one of those kind of stores, you work with the public. And people can be awful nasty. But you know the people that the workers behind the cash register ought to be happy to see is the chosen ones of God. The chosen one of God, when you go to a restaurant, they see you walk in, the first thing on their mind was, oh no, here comes them Christians after church. Oh no, here comes them tightwads. They don't ever leave a tip, you know. You got somebody sitting there, it's a millionaire, and they're trying to figure out whether it ought to be 10 cent, 10% or 15%. You know what I found out real quick? Folks that work the hardest don't have the much, they tip the most. They really tip the most a lot of times. And, and the thing is, is that it's because sometimes we don't let our position dictate our actions. And a lot of that reasoning is because we don't realize our position. 
If you don't know who you are, you're certainly not going to act like it a lot of times. You have to understand that you're one of the chosen of God because before time began, God knew you were going to receive Christ. He couldn't help but know because He's sovereign. God knows everything. And isn't that wonderful? And because of that position, because of who I am in Christ, I ought to want the whole world to know that I am His. I'm living for Him. Then the second thing, and I'll move on quickly. We look on in the verse, it says, election according to the foreknowledge of God. The Father through what? Through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Why do we act different? It's because we are chosen and it's because we are sanctified. Now we as free will Baptists, we teach progressive sanctification. That is, when you get saved, you're not automatically perfect. Anybody in here perfect? I hope not. Because I raised my hand just to try to see if I got anybody else who'd raise it with me. You know how that works. But not a soul, not a one of us in here can profess perfection. I bet somebody messed up this morning. I bet a few of you men made your wife mad before you ever got here there's most likely the reality that all of us have messed up somewhere today. We're not perfect. We're not a perfect people. But what does it mean that we have been sanctified? The blood of Christ has been applied to our life and our sins have been covered. So we have been made different. Do you realize when God looks down out of heaven, He doesn't look at you the same way as He looks at somebody that's lost? He doesn't look at you the same way He looks at an unsaved person. When he looks at you, praise God, he sees something that is very valuable. When God the Father looks at you, he sees something that is beyond the price. It's priceless. What he sees is the blood of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, applied to your heart, which has washed away your sins. Don't you love that song? Nothing washed away my sins but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain, no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm going to tell you, it's a great thing when you think about the blood being applied to your heart. Amen? Changes things. I react differently because I know who I am in Christ. I am a chosen one. I'm one of His. But He has also cleansed me and made me different. He's thought enough of me that He sent His darling Son to die on Calvary's cross, to shed His blood, to cleanse me from my sins, to sanctify me, to make me different. So we are sanctification of the spirit, spirit, but notice we are sanctified unto something, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. When you go back over in Exodus chapter 24, you see the outlay there of the priest, or in this case it was Aaron, working to apply the blood to the altar. And that is, what was it for? It was for the sanctifying of the people of God. And you know what? We need to think about and we need to keep in our mind every time we face people in this world, hey, I'm walking around as a believer that has been changed, sanctified, cleansed by the blood of Christ. And because of that, people are watching my life and I'm representing Him and I do not want to bring shame on Jesus. We're living in a time where the world needs Christians to react differently. Act like you're one of the chosen. Act like you've been sanctified. And I'm going to tell you, Christians, we believe in progressive sanctification. And that is, when you get saved, you ought to look more saved by the time you get old. Now that's just a simple East Tennessee way of putting it, alright? You get more saved, amen? I'd teach English to do a real good job, wouldn't I? The reality is, a lot of us, when we get saved, 
Some people don't know you're saved at all. Some people never get no further than just that little beginning step. But I'm going to tell you something. You can tell the difference when you're around somebody that's grown in the sanctification and in the grace of God. Those are the type of people that this world needs today. Why do Christians react differently? Because we're chosen, we're sanctified. But also we've got, we're something else. I want you to notice with me in verse number 11. I mean verse number 3, excuse me. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us, that is, He has fathered us, so He has extended His rich mercy, He has fathered us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That word lively there emphasized in the original means to be active. It's an active hope. So why do we act differently? We're chosen, we're sanctified, and we're hopeful. You know, a lot of Christians don't seem to be very hopeful. They don't act very hopeful. We act like sometimes that somebody has just put us through a bunch of persimmons to suck on. Really. A lot of times we act like somebody have gave you a lemon. Now, I know when I gave that illustration one time, there's a little smart aleck young and looked up at me and said, I like lemons. Well, I like lemons and tea, but I don't like to suck on them. Now, if you do, that's fine. But that's a pretty, pretty tart thing to suck on a raw lemon. But a lot of Christians act as if they have nothing to be happy about. Now, I'm not saying you go around all the time with a smile on your face and la 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 and everything's good because everything's not good all the time. But when the world starts falling apart, the very ones that should seem to be the most hopeful, the very ones that should seem to have the more outstanding joy ought to be Christians. I'm a little fearful that we didn't take advantage of the COVID crisis as well as we should have. I'm afraid that I didn't. I I tried my best to make good decisions. But to a degree, I didn't. But when I had my last little bout with my heart, and I was telling them about it, just back in January, I had a stent put in the left artery, main artery in my heart. Actually, it's the third one that I've got put in there. Or I've got three now. The whole artery is nothing but a stent from top to bottom. I had a 100% blockage. Had a 75 also. Doc told me that's not a good thing to have 100% in that main artery. I was laying in my bed, and honestly, the only thing I could think about is not really me, but I thought about my family, but I knew what was going on in my life. I knew who had my life and where I was going if God took me. But God had helped me finally come to a place to where I was not really afraid of dying. Listen, I knew that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. I know that I've been saved since I was 10 years old. But sometimes it's hard not to let fear take hold of you. And during this last crisis in 2020, it scared me to death in the beginning. I'm being totally honest. I'm very transparent with people when I preach. I don't believe lying can help anybody or pretending to be something you're not. And I guarantee you, some of you can raise your hand and say you were pretty fearful yourself. But the one thing that helped me through it all was one, the faith of my wife, God bless her. But then also, I turned to this book and I read this Bible to the point that my eyes would hurt. And God brought me to a place to help me understand that, listen, How you react is going to be a whole lot of how other people react around you. And you've got to change how you're reacting. You've got to put your hope in me and not in anything else. You've got to realize that it's me that's in control. And so you know what God did? He sent me this heart situation. And the doctor looked at me and this is what he said. Most likely, you've been walking around since October with that 100% blockage. And it was the end of January before they ever got to it. 
I was still working. I was still preaching. Preaching the same that I'm preaching right here. I would lose my breath. I would hurt in my chest. I would preach and my chest would hurt sometimes so bad I felt like somebody was binding my heart. I knew something was going on, but I had to wait to get something done until a time could come they could do something. But I'm going to tell you why I was able to keep doing it. It's because I realized that when God's done with me, He's done. I realized the one that I can put hope in was the same one that saved me, thus He chose me. The same one that cleansed me and sanctified me is the same one that I can be hopeful in. And the hope that we have is an active hope. And people need to see our hope. And that our hope's not in anything else, but our hope is in God Almighty. Our hope is in God our Father. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the strengthening of the Holy Spirit. Our hope is in God completely. That is where our hope lies. That's where my hope has to lie. And I hope tonight you understand as a believer you have people around you everywhere from the folks that live next to you to the people that work at the stores you go in to the doctor's offices that you visit to the nurses that look after you to the doctors that talk to you wherever you go. You've got a world full of people that they need to see us reacting differently. Because we can. Because we've been purchased. Because why? He chose us. Before the foundation of the world, He knew us. By His foreknowledge, He knew you and I. And praise God, He cleansed us. So thus, we can give the world hope. But why else should we react differently? Look at the fourth thing. I told you I won't be all night. It says in verse number 4, To an inheritance incorruptible, that's an inheritance that won't, just won't be destroyed. It can't decay down. It's undefiled. It's not been tainted. That fadeth not away. It's not something that's here today and gone tomorrow. Reserved in heaven for you. Why do Christians react differently? We're chosen. We're sanctified. We're hopeful. But we're also heirs. We're heirs of the kingdom. We have something that is greater than what anybody else on this earth has. We have a place in heaven. Now, I love the King James Bible. I, I use some other translations, I will admit, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you why I love the old King James for one reason. Because I like to read that I've got a mansion waiting on me, not just a room. I can't help it, okay? I just believe when God went, went to heaven, Jesus went to heaven to prepare a place for me, He just didn't prepare a little bitty old room somewhere. All right? I've been in some hospital rooms they thought were Cadillac rooms, and I'm telling you, they need some help. Amen? I'm looking forward to my mansion that the Lord has gone to prepare. I'm looking forward to the inheritance that is awaiting me as a believer. And because of that, we can react differently. We can act differently because the world down here, this lost society we're in, does not have that. They've not been promised that inheritance. They're not heirs to anything but destruction. But what does it mean to be an heir? It means that it's yours. Nobody can take that away. Nobody can give that to somebody else. You know, somebody can give your inheritance away down here. Do you know that? The government can take your inheritance down here. But the inheritance you have in Jesus Christ, nobody can take it away from you. Nobody. And because of that, I can react differently. Oh, there's so much more there, but let's move on to this latter thing. And it says in verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith into salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. We are kept by the power of God. Folks, when we look at this text here, that we are kept by the power of God. There's some things that I'd love for us to notice here a little bit within the context of this. And I'm glad that we are kept by His power and anointed by His power. Ephesians chapter 1, 
verses 12 through 14 says this, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed, ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now I want you to get a hold of that. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, and here that means the down payment of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. The reality that we have been sealed by the Holy Spirit is very important here because notice with me what verse 5 says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that you are kept or who are kept, that is we, the believers, those that have been foreknown and predestined by God who are kept by the what? Power of God. And the power of God is what? The Holy Spirit in your life. And so the power of God through faith. And it's the Holy Spirit working in your life through faith. That faith that the Spirit of God initiated, that you put in place, you believed. Unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last day. Colossians chapter 1 verses 28 through 23 says, And to you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If ye continue, now listen to this, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister. That is, you continue what? You continue faithfully and you continue in the blessings of God. How is it that we can continue? How is it when one rededicates their life, how is it when one gets saved, how is it that any of us can live the Christian life, how is it that any of us can react differently in a sin-cursed, depraved, debauched society? It is through the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God. God is the one that helps you to be what you need to be. And the reason that a lot of us sometimes are not reacting like we should is because the Spirit of God is not being allowed to work in our hearts like He desires to. You, you, just as it's you by faith, through faith, that you've trusted Christ and you turn that key that opened the door unto salvation that was given to you through the riches of the glory of God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is you that allows the Holy Spirit to work in you because the Bible tells us what? To be filled with the Spirit. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And in the original, the word filling there means that simply is, is that you're overflowing. You're being filled up. And it's not something that is always present. It is something that is continually growing. And you've got to let God fill you with His Spirit. Why do we react differently? Why should we react differently? Because we are chosen. We've been chosen through His foreknowledge. Because we've been sanctified. Because we are hope-filled. Because you and I have an inheritance. And because we are kept by the power of the Spirit of God. Desperately today, Christian, brothers and sisters, this world needs you and I to be acting differently. What are people seeing in you? How are people reacting to how you react? I, tonight, 
I know we're standing here tonight looking out, no doubt, to a bunch of good folk that love Jesus. And the reason you're here is because you want God to do something in your life. But I'm here to tell you tonight, you've got to let Christ work so you can react in a way that this world will want what you have. That's what I want the world to know. Let's stand with her head bowed and eyes closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this opportunity. We thank you, Father, for your word. Father, tonight I have...